It is with great pleasure that I welcome Emily Beeney. Thank you so much, Scott, um, for that generous introduction. And um, so many thanks to you and Isabel for continuing to support this annual lecture series in honor of Robert Boardingham. I'd also like to thank all of my lovely MFA colleagues for inviting me here to speak tonight, and of course, everyone who's come out to talk about Manet together. So just as Scott pointed out, the name Edouard Manet brings to mind artistic revolution, epitomized by the large provocative pictures he painted in the 1860s. Still in his 20s and with a great annual exhibition known as the Salon on his mind, Manet set out to compete with the old masters in works like Luncheon on the Grass, which borrowed its scandalous nude picnicker from Raphael, or the Olympia, which reimagined Titian's Venus of Urbino as a contemporary Parisian prostitute. Both of these works are today in the Musée d'Orsay, and they sent shockwaves through the French art world when first exhibited. Critics deplored their supposed vulgarity and lack of finish, but Manet's brisk, broad application of paint and his commitment to depicting modern life won the admiration of young progressive artists who would go on to form the Impressionist movement. This side of Manet, as Scott's pointed out, is the one most of us know and love, the one with which Bostonians in particular are well acquainted thanks to the MFA's superb holdings in the artist's early work. By way of a reminder, your collection includes, among other pictures, the great unfinished execution of Maximilian, dated to 1867, and ostentatiously indebted to Goya. And perhaps even more famously, The Street Singer, a monumental single-figure composition inspired by Velazquez and his 17th century contemporaries, dated to 1862, and recently cleaned to magnificent effect. This picture shares with the luncheon on the grass and the Olympia, the same russet-haired, gray-eyed model. Um, a young woman called Victorine Meuron, who stares out of all three works with an almost eerie self-possession. Manet's small, searching portrait of Victorine, quite distinct from the various pictures in which she plays the role of street singer or prostitute, also hangs here in Boston and is, I have to say, the picture that were the museum to catch fire in the course of this lecture, I might run into the galleries to see. Hers is the face of Manet's early ambitions, the face of modern painting in the 1860s. But in the late 1870s and early 1880s, Manet produced a strikingly different body of work. Stylish portraits and boudoir scenes, shimmering still lives, and powdery pastels. Graceful, diminutive watercolors, freely brushed scenes of suburban gardens, and Parisian cafes. These works form the focus of this evening's lecture and the focus, too, of Manet and Modern Beauty, the first exhibition ever devoted to the artist's last years, which opens at the Art Institute of Chicago at the end of this month, continuing on to the Getty Museum in Los Angeles in October. The works we'll explore tonight are not late in a conventional sense, for Manet died prematurely at 51 on April 30th, 1883 after a long struggle with tabus dorsalis, a neurological disorder that paralyzed his left leg and is generally associated with syphilis. So unlike Titian and Rembrandt, or indeed his own friends and contemporaries, Dugas, Renoir, and Monet, Manet did not live long enough to develop an old age style. The work of his last years is nevertheless quite distinct from what preceded it, characterized by a new lightness of spirit, of palette, and often of touch. Painted during his long and painful illness, Manet's elegant Parisian ladies and carefully arranged bouquets sparkle with an insistent, perhaps even defiant, sense of life. This aspect of Manet's oeuvre has been relatively little studied and has, in fact, often puzzled art historians. Its sheer prettiness poses a challenge to our received notion of the painter as a rebel or outcast, the avant-garde hero, the grand refusé, the modern art historian Douglas Cooper's assessment of Manet's late work 
is entirely typical of most 20th century responses to it. And I quote, the pictures of these last years, for the most part slender pastel portraits of elegant ladies, become increasingly weak and flashy. Here and there a still life of flowers, light and delicate in its use of paint, um, appears as a charming diversion, but no more. Minor genres and minor works, it seems, were necessarily one and the same. Manet's dabbling in supposedly minor media, moreover, pastel and watercolor, uh, was borderline unforgivable. The gendered language um, of this rather sneering assessment, elegant ladies, weak and flashy, light, delicate, charming, but no more, hopefully stands out for us today. But what are we to make of a Manet who perused fashion magazines, a Manet who shopped carefully for his model's outfits, painted bouquets as presents, and wrote for flirtatious illustrated notes? In fact, his contemporaries often described Manet, whom we see here in an iconic portrait in Chicago by Henri Fontalatour, as a dandy, an elegant dresser, a man about town, a charmer, a wit. More than the ambitious, combative paintings of his youth, the late work seems to capture something of its author's personal suaveness. Reconsidering these objects promises us a rare pleasure, I think, of meeting afresh a painter we might have thought we knew already. If you know just one late painting by Manet, it is probably this one, a bar at the Folie Bergère, which now belongs to the Courtauld Institute in London, depicting a barmaid and her wares arranged before a vast mirror reflecting the fashionable crowd, as well as the tiny green feet of a trapeze artist up here in the corner at what was essentially a very hip nightclub in Paris. This painting is a tour de force of reflection and light an essay in the hard, glittering surfaces of commodified pleasure in the modern city. It is today widely considered the artist's final masterpiece. But when it was first shown at Manet's last salon in 1882, it was overshadowed by his other submission, a small, brightly colored painting of a pretty girl dressed in the latest fashions and silhouetted against a backdrop of rhododendrons in bloom. Titled simply Jeanne, this painting caused a sensation at the salon garnering for Manet some of the most effusive reviews of his career. Since we are speaking of living flowers, one critic infused, let me introduce you to Jeanne by Edouard Manet. She is not a woman, she is a bouquet, truly a visual perfume. Delighted by its success, Manet planned to make this composition the first in a series representing the four seasons and assigned it the alternative title of Spring, by which the painting is commonly known today. Spring joined the Getty Collection in 2014, and our upcoming exhibition is really organized around it. Since even more than its spectacular salamate, Spring sums up so many of Manet's artistic concerns at the end of his career. His explorations of fashion and of flowers, his growing interest in the so-called minor genres of portraiture and still life, his complicated relationship with the contemporary Impressionist movement, and most especially, his growing desire to make it all look easy. The young woman who posed for Spring was a model and actress, or at least at that point aspiring actress, called Anne Darlow. She also modeled for Renoir at about the same time and made her stage debut five years later under the name Jeanne de Marcy. But as the MFA's own Helen Burnham has pointed out in her groundbreaking work on this painting and on the role of fashion in Manet's practice more broadly, Contemporary viewers saw the young woman in this picture as a specimen of a familiar social type, the modern Parisienne, a figure characterized by her beauty and her youth, but above all by her fashionability. Here, I'd like just to pause for a moment to underscore how important Helen's scholarship, uh, past and present, has been for our exhibition project and to our understanding of Manet's late work. Um, I hope, of course, you'll have an opportunity to come see the show, but if you don't, um, please check out Helen's excellent essay in our exhibition catalog. Um, so, to return to the Getty painting, Manet assembled the model's outfit himself, visiting the shops of a famous dressmaker and milliner to select the dainty flowered fabric of her day dress and the elaborate trimmings of her hat, adorned with lace, silk flowers, and a black velvet bow. He painted and repainted the handle of her parasol to get the angle just right, and lavished careful attention on her fine leather gloves and golden bangle. Finally, 
As the bright green area just left of her face attests, he fussed endlessly over her profile, gradually retracting it to achieve the pert, upturned nose found in many 19th century representations of the Parisienne type. Manet's late fascination with the Parisienne as a creature of fashion had its roots much earlier in his career and reflected his enduring engagement with the thought of Charles Baudelaire, the great poet and author of The Flowers of Evil, who was a close friend of Manet's and whose essay, The Painter of Modern Life, published in 1863, the young artist had surely read. In it, Baudelaire insisted that beauty was comprised of two parts. First, there was universal, divine, unchanging beauty, exemplified by the antique and the art of museums. But then there was also, no less importantly, contingent, particular, changeable beauty, a notion of the beautiful that was specific to time and place. What had been considered beautiful in, say, Paris in 1763 was not necessarily the same as what one considered beautiful in Paris in 1863, let alone in Boston in 2019. For Baudelaire, contingent beauty served as a pleasing envelope for universal beauty, the stylish packaging in which the divine could be delivered to mere mortals. Fashion, always changing and evolving as trends come and go, was the central metaphor Baudelaire used to explain contingent beauty. And indeed, the title for tonight's talk is borrowed from the first section of his essay, Beauty, Fashion, and Happiness. If Manet's early work, all the Victorine Meurant pictures with their self-conscious references to Raphael, Titian, Velasquez, and so on, remained preoccupied with universal beauty, his later work turned unabashedly, even exclusively, to contingent beauty, as I think Spring Here demonstrates. The defining quality of contingent beauty, of course, is its impermanence. Fashions change, youth fades, flowers wilt. In all these senses, the Getty picture is also a painting about impermanence, the fleeting nature of beauty, of fashion, and perhaps by extension of happiness. Seen as the work of a dying artist, Spring also, I think, becomes a picture about beauty snatched from the jaws of time, beauty embraced in the very teeth of acute physical suffering. By 1881, advancing paralysis in Manet's left leg, the most painful symptom of his illness, made standing before an easel for long pe periods extremely difficult. And so with the exception of a few um, large exhibition pictures like The Bar, the vast majority of his late works are more intimate in scale than the somber monumental paintings of the 1860s. Just to give you a sense of the relative scale of the street singer and spring, here they are to scale side by side. But scale, of course, is not all that distinguishes these two pictures, painted almost 20 years apart. We immediately notice the high-keyed palette of spring, no longer bound by the subtle grays and blacks that Manet had borrowed from Velasquez for the street singer. Nor can we miss the shift of subject. An elegant young lady on a stroll has replaced a hungry street musician. Finally, the brushwork, already loose by academic standards in 1862, has become more insistently visible by 1881. Short, broken strokes, strokes suggest light filtering through leaves and lace fluttering on an unseen breeze in the Getty painting. Jeanne herself retains her solidity, but her surroundings dissolve into a rush and shimmer of brightly colored marks. A comparison of Victorine's and Jeanne's faces reveals the subtle evolution of Manet's handling away from the broad, creamy application of the early 1860s toward nervous, fluttery, short strokes, often made with a fine-tipped brush in the early 1880s. The difference is still more evident, I think, in a comparison of the two figures' sleeves and backdrops. Victorine's sleeve is creamily painted and harshly lit with abrupt contrasts between light and dark gray. Whereas, um, so the cafe behind her, where you can see there are hats hanging on the wall and a waiter in a white apron waiting to take an order, this is articulated in, with thick strokes of paint and pretty murky hues. By contrast, Jeanne's sleeve is described with brief, slender strokes of high-keyed color and silhouetted against an equally bright backdrop, so thinly painted that the ground, that is the initial preparatory layer, actually shows through between some of the strokes in the leaves. So those light areas you're seeing are, is actually the ground with just a very thin sort of wash of pale green over it. 
So what happened between the early years and the late? How, in other words, do we get from the street singer to spring? The decades that separate these two pictures obviously saw many developments in Manet's life, but I'd like to call particular attention to just a few of these, which were pertinent to his stylistic evolution. In 1868, Manet was introduced to Berthe Morisot, a bright, promising painter who would become one of his most important artistic interlocutors, as well as a founding member of the Impressionist group. Um, like Manet, Morisot came from a well-to-do family, but in her case, this meant that as a respectable upper-middle-class wo upper class woman, Morisot couldn't frequent the cafes where Manet had already befriended Claude Monet, Edgar Degas, Auguste Renoir, and other future members of the Impressionist group. Manet and Morisot's early exchanges, therefore, often took place in her mother's drawing room. It was there in the early spring of 1870 that she sought his advice on this picture, um, which portrays her mother and her sister and is today at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. She planned to submit it to the Salon. But rather than making a few suggestions, as she'd asked, Manet picked up Morisot's brush and actually repainted the figure of her mother at right whose comparatively harsh modeling contrasts with the supple finesse of Morisot's handling elsewhere on the canvas. She was mortified and felt he had ruined the picture. And I think it's quite important for the future evolution of their relationship that her reaction to his meddling was not one of worshipful gratitude um, or subservience, but rather of frustration and embarrassment. They nevertheless remained friends, and she posed for him many times, lending her dark beauty to a whole host of pictures, of which we see just three particularly iconic examples here. For all her frustration with his meddling, Morisot no doubt learned a great deal from watching Manet at work and engaging him in conversation. But the relationship was by no means a one-way street, and I'll think, I think we'll see that one of the interesting things about Manet's late work is just how much, by the end of the 1870s, he is really learning from her. Another key event, also in 1869 or 1870, Manet took on his first and only pupil, Eva Gonzalez, the daughter of a prominent novelist. At the same salon where Morisot showed the picture of her mother and sister that she felt Manet had butchered, Manet showed a portrait of Gonzalez, cast as a kind of genteel, amateurish lady painter, which she most certainly was not. This painting is now in the National Gallery in London, and, and it's... Um, sort of the image by which Gonzalez is most often remembered today. But in fact, before coming to Manet, she had already received several years of professional training in the studio of the academic painter Charles Chaplin, where she'd become, among other things, an accomplished pastelist. Here we see an early example of her work in that medium, a lyrical Rococo scene today at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. As in the case of Morisot, Gonzalez learned a great deal from Manet at the beginning of their relationship, but as we'll see, by the time we arrive at Manet's late work, he's probably started to learn much more from her. These two female colleagues, I think, will be key to our understanding of Manet's late stylistic development. But so too, I think, will be a slightly more happenstance sequence of events that yanked him out of his established practice in the 1860s and emboldened him to try something new. These events might begin with what was called l'année terrible, the terrible year of 1870 to 71, which witnessed the siege of Paris by Prussian troops, the popular uprising known as the Commune, and its violent suppression by French government forces in June of 1871. Manet remained in Paris during the siege, enlisting alongside Degas and other artists and the French National Guard. But he left the capital before the Commune and its violent suppression. Um, he memorialized these events, nevertheless, in, in this watercolor, uh, today in Budapest, also in a, in a lithograph, uh, where a, a familiar Parisian apartment block and, and lamppost sort of bear witness to this scene of a firing squad and a street piled with corpses. On returning to the city in late 1871, Manet was introduced to an art dealer called Paul Dion Rouel, pictured here. Durand Rouel, as you may remember, would become famous in subsequent decades as the dealer of the Impressionists, notably the man who brought Impressionism to America. But in 1871, the Impressionist group had not yet been formalized, um, and Durand Rouel had only just met a few of its future members um, who, like him, had taken refuge from L'Année Terrible in London. 
So we should remember here that up to this point, Manet has sold virtually nothing. His studio in the Bohemian Batignon neighborhood um, is bursting with nearly, nearly 50 canvases, most of them very large and painted over the preceding decade. Then, in January 1872, he sells to Durand Ruel in a single transaction 23 canvases, almost half of his production to date, freeing up all kinds of space, both literally and metaphorically, to make new work. You'll note first, so the, these are all sort of roughly to scale, and you'll, you'll note first of all just how large and how dark most of these canvases are, and also that the street singer was, was part of that deal. With the proceeds of the sale, Manet moved his studio from the Batignolles to a big, bright space, a former fencing studio in an up-and-coming neighborhood called the Europe District, near the Gare Saint-Lazare train station. This picture, today in Washington, gives us a view across the railroad cutting through the steam from a passing locomotive um, uh, on the tracks below and to the door, actually, of Manet's studio, in the, the new studio in the Rue de, de Saint-Pétersbourg. The new neighborhood became a hub of artistic activity. A number of painters, perhaps most notably the impressionist Gustave Caillebotte, had studios nearby, and Claude Monet commuted to his various rented houses in Normandy through the Saint-Lazare train station, where he would paint a famous series of trains in 1877. Just a few blocks away on the Place Pigalle was the Café de la Nouvelle Athènes, the new favorite watering hole for progressive artists, entertainers, and writers. Um, the young poet Stéphane Mallarmé, who had a day job teaching English at a nearby high school, became an almost daily visitor to Manet's studio in these years, and their conversations about art and impermanence seem to have colored the painter's self-understanding and stylistic development. Here we see the poet in a portrait Manet painted at that studio, a glittering Japanese textile stretched on the wall behind him, um, and a wisp of smoke rising from his cigar. Mallarmé wrote of his visits with Manet at the time, when he casts away the cares of art and chats with a friend in his studio, he expresses himself with brilliancy. Then it is that he tells what he means by painting, what new destinies are yet in store for it. The rupture of the Anne Terrible, the sale to Durand Ruel, the move to the big bright studio in the new neighborhood, all helped uh, push Manet's work towards new destinies, as I think we begin to sense from the brightening overall tonality of this picture, signed and dated 1873. But the relative solidity of the figures, the broad, even strokes of paint used to describe the woman's dress and hat, as well as the employment one last time of Victorine Meurin as a model, remind us that we haven't yet arrived at late Manet. The mid-1870s, of course, also witnessed another determining event for the story of French, French painting and for Manet's own development, namely the first exhibition of the Impressionist group held in the spring of 1874 at the studio of the portrait photographer, Nadar. Um, so here we see the catalog of the exhibition and then the, a view from the street of Nadar's studio. The exhibition featured works by, among other artists, Manet's friends Berthe Morisot, uh, Edgar Degas, a picture you all know from the MFA collection, Auguste Renoir, also an MFA picture, and of course, Claude Monet, whose sketch-like impression sunrise, pictured here and today at the Musée Marmottan, would give the movement its name. Manet declined his friend's invitation to join the group, preferring the salon as an arena of combat for his own art. He displayed this work at the salon that year, but his ties to several members of the Impressionist group grew tighter over the following summer, when Morisot became engaged to Manet's brother, Eugène, transforming a professional friendship into a familial connection. And Manet joined the Monets at Argenteuil, a suburb on the Seine where Monet painted the river from his famous studio boat, and Manet painted Monet at work, a picture today in Munich. <coughs> Monet, of course, was a famously quick worker. We see here a picture from the National Gallery of Art painted on the same stretch of river as Manet's scene of Monet painting. Monet's brief brush strokes, um, shimmering light effects, and bright, cool palette effectively captured the sense of instantaneity, 
a sunbeam here, a breeze there, a passing cloud arrested in a single moment, the most contingent of nature's beauties. In his own paintings made or begun at Argenteuil, Manet showed an eagerness to learn from his younger colleagues' methods, breaking up his brushwork into brief stuttering strokes that suggest airiness and speed, wind-ruffled water and shifting skies. Though figures, carefully posed and dressed, still dominate these scenes, their landscape elements frankly emulate those of Monet. Here, for example, Manet arranged his couple, dressed for a boating excursion, before that same stretch of the Seine, with familiar smokestacks visible on the horizon. Oh, you can see the smokestack. Though Manet would never exhibit his own work with the Impressionists, he was widely perceived, not least by his friend Mallarmé, as the leader of the group, an honorary chef d'école. And so I think it's quite interesting in the summer of 1874 to see him trying to figure out this new approach for which he was somehow supposedly responsible, to master the methods of a younger artist, Monet, who was and always would be a much more facile painter than Manet himself. This is another picture today in the Metropolitan Museum that Manet probably started at Argenteuil in 1874, and continued working on for at least a year, only exhibiting it at the Salon in 1879. That's a far cry, of course, from the rapid open-air methods of Monet, who said this wonderful, heartbreaking thing about his older friend's technique. Manet always wanted his paintings to look as if done at the first attempt. But often in the evening, he scraped down with his palette knife everything he had painted during the day, he kept only the underpainting, over which he would improvise anew. This is not the only account we have of Manet scraping off, wiping down, starting over. He routinely demanded 20 or 30 sessions with his models, scrubbing off his work and starting anew at each sitting. As we head into the late work, I think it's important to consider Manet's increasing desire in the 1870s to make his work appear spontaneous and impressionistic, its execution as effortlessly modern as its subject matter. This picture's cool plein air palette and breezy brushwork must have looked almost exaggeratedly impressionistic at the Salon of 1879, where it hung beside a very different canvas that Manet had been grappling with for over a year. Here we find another couple, the woman again at left, elegantly dressed and seated, this time in three-quarter profile, beside a male companion oriented toward the viewer. Here, though, the similarities between the two canvases end. In this painting, today in Berlin, not a leaf stirs, not a breath of wind, for the green background does not indicate an outdoor setting. As the painting's original title, In the Conservatory, indicates, these are potted palms and hothouse orchids. We are in a glassed-in greenhouse or winter garden, a popular feature of Parisian townhouses in this period. Manet's models for the picture, one Monsieur and Madame Jules Guillemet, here strike rather awkward poses. She stares into the middle distance while he looks down, but not quite at her. Their proper left hands, sporting matching wedding bands, almost but don't quite touch. Are they playing the roles of a married couple or perhaps an adulterous one? Is this a scene of seduction or of boredom? As in so many of Manet's best pictures, the composition derives its strange power from its refusal to tell a straightforward story forcing us to look and wonder and look again. Madame Guillemet was renowned at the time as a connoisseur of fashion, an interest increasingly shared by Manet himself. She became a favorite model and correspondent, and I think it's no accident in this picture, which is so tightly painted in many respects, that her ultra-chic dress, rigorously tailored and sumptuously pleated, is really the only portion of the composition painted at a gallop, as one critic put it with long, slender skeins of blue and gray rapidly applied and still plainly visible. The dress and Manet's way of painting it, in other words, are both up to the minute and modern. Swift, cross-hatching brushstrokes spill across the whole canvas in the next genre scene that Manet exhibited at the Salon in 1880. Chez le Père La Tuille, which now hangs in the Musée des Beaux-Arts at Tournai, shows a young man and woman apparently shutting down the lunch service, for there are no other customers in sight, at a quite specific restaurant just off the Avenue de Clichy. Not far from Manet's studio, the place was owned by Monsieur Gauthier Latouille, whose son modeled the ardent young man at left. 
The woman was originally posed by Hélène André, a popular actress whose blonde hair was apparently painted out when Manet, impatient with her rehearsal schedule, replaced her with another model. Fingering the stem of his companion's wine glass, the young man rests his other hand on the back of her chair with a proprietary air. But her lost profile and upright posture, enhanced by a truly splendid feathered hat, do not seem to invite or encourage his attentions. A waiter in the background at right seems to pause, unsure whether to interrupt this interlude with coffee. Here we are firmly in the territory of late Manet. The palette is blonde and blue, the glassware sparkles, the female protagonist is formidably chic, the leafy courtyard shimmers with energetic brushwork. The lively surface and convin convincingly natural light try to persuade us that this scene was observed and recorded on the spot at Père Latouille's restaurant, but in point of fact, the picture was probably painted in large part at Manet's studio. Signed and dated 1879, the painting coincides with a sudden precipitous decline in Manet's health. By the end of that year, he was in excruciating pain and had started dragging his left leg behind him when he walked. He had changed studios once again, this time moving just a few blocks away to a space in the Rue d'Amsterdam, right around the corner from the family apartment. His world swiftly shrank to the block or two that separated apartment from studio. The sunny table, the diffident waiter, the amorous youth, and his unimpressed date, these were likely all arranged in Manet's studio, where he kept a cafe table for just such purposes and began to entertain the friends he could no longer venture out to meet. He didn't let his illness get in the way of his social life, clearly, or indeed of his professional ambitions that spring. Just a few weeks before this, that, the picture we've just seen went on view at the Salon, Manet mounted a solo show of recent work at the much more intimate venue of the Vie Moderne, a commercial gallery affiliated with a magazine of the same name, devoted, as you might guess, to la vie moderne, modern life, art, culture, and fashion in the French capital. So here you see the catalog of that show, illustrated with a couple of sketches by Manet. As you can see, the exhibition contained just 25 works, all painted in the last four or five years, the majority of them in what was, for Manet, a novel medium, pastel. So you have the list of the oil paintings on the left and the pastels on the right. Um, showcasing recent work of a very different kind from the large-scale compositions that he generally presented at the Salon, the Vie Moderne show provides a helpful snapshot of Manet's emerging late manner. Among the oil paintings, cafe scenes predominated. These included Plum Brandy, a comparatively early picture painted in about 1877, and today at the National Gallery in Washington. Here a young woman, modeled again by Ellen André, wears a distracted look and a pink confection of a dress. A brandy-soaked plum sits on the table before her. Her slightly flashy attire and public consumption of alcohol might suggest that she was meant to be a prostitute awaiting a client at a place like the Café de la Nouvelle Athènes, but Manet's treatment of his subject here is typically open-ended, leaving us room to wonder. More recently painted cafe, cafe scenes shown at the Vie Moderne offered a similar sensation of watching strangers in a public place and wondering what they're thinking. This one, the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, depicts a cafe scene, uh, a cafe concert or cabaret. In the middle distance, a waitress drains a beer and in the foreground, a weary young woman smokes a cigarette. The top-hatted gentleman beside her plainly belongs to a quite different class. And indeed, among the, so among the pleasures for sale at the cafes and bars in Manet's neighborhood was the opportunity for wealthy men to mingle with members of other social classes. The main entertainment, though, takes place on a stage just out of view at right. So you can see everybody sort of looking off this way. And the, so the stage is invisible, except we can see its mirror reflection in this wall-mounted mirror at the back of the composition, which is a sort of a, a motif that he works through and works through and then receives its final version in the bar at the Folie Berger. Um, another cafe scene, or cabaret scene, shown at the Vie Moderne, this time with the stage and orchestra plainly visible and a waitress serving beer to a blue-bloused worker in the foreground was actually a fragment of a much larger composition. 
In about 1878, Manet had started, cut up, and reused for parts a planned salon painting depicting the Brasserie de Reichshofen, a beer hall near the Place Pigalle. Here you can see the two halves of the composition, today uh, in Winterthur, Switzerland, and at the National Gallery in London. The backgrounds have obviously been reworked, becoming in one case a window plastered with posters, and in the other a stage. Um, but you can see that these two halves of the table were originally one table, one continuous table, with the two rows of spectators sitting opposite each other. Um, so Manet slices it up, and then to transform the right-hand half of the composition into a finished pic picture suitable for exhibition at the Vie Moderne, he adds a strip of canvas to the right-hand edge of the composition. So today, because the paints used for the original part and the added strip have aged at different rates, you can see this very marked color shift between the two chunks. The whole project, I think, testifies to the laborious, sort of clandestinely laborious process of working and reworking um, that Monet tells us uh, was so characteristic of his friend's methods. Cafes, though, weren't the only sites of urban amusement represented in the Vie Moderne show. This dizzily patterned and painted scene portrays an indoor skating rink, a faddish new entertainment venue in Paris. The model for the chic blonde Parisienne who stands just outside the guardrail of the rink with a scribbly pink child, this is actually a child, <laughs> um, <laughs> in tow, uh, was Henriette Auxerre, an actress and notorious demi-mondaine who had appeared three years earlier playing a more explicitly autobiographical role in Manet's 1877 salon submission, Nana. There, dressed in her underwear, a satin corset, lace-trimmed petticoat, and embroidered stockings, Auxerre played a wealthy courtesan, that is, the very highest-end variety of prostitute in 19th century Paris. Powdering her face before a mirror while a top-hatted admirer looks on at right, Auxerre's nana returns our gaze without shame or apology. Little wonder, I think, that this painting had been rejected by the conservative salon jury in 1877. Undaunted, Manet had put it on view in the window of a ladies' luxury goods shop in the Boulevard des Capucines for all of Paris to see, and three years later showed at the Vie Moderne a picture he called his re-nana, a second version of the same subject, stripped of its luxurious setting and winking social commentary. This painting now hangs at the Guggenheim in New York. Turning the models back to us, the composition reveals a snowy expanse of neck and shoulder, withholding the reflection we might expect to find on the gleaming face of the mirror. Dissolving form into light and color, the scene is shivering, sensuous, touched all over by the artist's hand, and yet peculiarly chaste. Manet would never have shown quite so sketch-like a painting at the Salon, but in the less formal context of the Vie Moderne show, it had its place, playfully gesturing to the prior scandal of Nana, but above all asserting Manet's position as the master sketcher and father of Impressionism. As it happened, his solo show coincided with the fifth Impressionist group exhibition, which opened just a week before within easy walking distance of the Vie Moderne gallery. There, his close friend, and of co course you will remember his sister-in-law, Berthe Moiseau, had displayed, a, a, or was currently displaying, a picture startlingly close to Before the Mirror in both its motif and its shimmering, suggestive brushwork. In this painting today in Chicago, a half-dressed woman once again turns her back to us, looking into a mirror at left, where we cannot see her reflection. Morizo's contributions to the 1880 Impressionist exhibition inspired stellar reviews, which often compared her to the 18th century master, Jeanne Honoré Fragonard. And indeed, the palette and style of handling that her picture shares with Manet's, a superabundance of white applied in swift, wispy strokes, these are far more typical of Morizo's practice at the time than of Manet's. So just for example and point of, of comparison, here are a couple of other pictures that Morizot showed in the 1880 Impressionist exhibition, this one today in the Musée d'Orsay, and this one in the National Gallery in London. So as you can see, I think, by 1880, the balance of influence has shifted. Manet is clearly, clearly looking to Morizot's example. 
The real stars of the show at the Vie Moderne, though, were the pastels, the majority of them bust-length portraits in a deceptively sketch-like idiom. They portrayed demi-mondaine celebrities like the actresses Valtesse de la Bigne and Marie Colombier, as well as more bourgeois ladies like the novelist Émile Zola's wife Alexandrine and Madame du Paty, married to a genre painter called Léon. Other subjects were themselves artists, the writer George Moore, the landscapist Alphonse Moreau, and even Constantin Guis, the magazine illustrator, now 80 years old, to whom Baudelaire had dedicated his 1863 essay, The Painter of Modern Life. The female portraits stole the show, however. Here we see one of Isabelle Le Meunier, pretty young sister-in-law to the publisher of La Vie Moderne, who also owned the affiliated gallery. It seems like maybe Manet is making nice to the owner of the gallery where he's exhibiting. I should perhaps point out that the largest collection of pastels um, from the Vie Moderne show is today at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where this portrait hangs. Individual works are also in Chicago, Paris, Edinburgh, and various private collections. But by the way, the MFA is home to one of Manet's late pastels, a portrait of the dandy and writer René Mezouroy, which probably postdates the Vie Moderne exhibition by a year or two. And I hope many of you had the chance to see it last year in Katie Hansen's excellent pastel exhibition. So as I was saying, um, the Vimodin, at the Vimo Down, the female portrait stole the show, and one critic proclaimed in his review, the famous head of the Impressionist school here shows himself in a whole new light as the painter of elegant women. Interestingly, since the original flourishing of pastels in the early 18th century, this medium had often been associated with women. Pastels, you remember, remember are actually sticks of dry color, similar to chalk. Their methods of manufacture and application were not so different from those of cosmetics. Applied dry pastels produce a velvety sheen. Crumbled, wetted up, and applied with a brush, they create a matte effect, more similar to gouache. Sold ready-made in myriad hues, pastels match the chromatic range of oil paints without requiring the same length, lengthy drying periods or elaborate studio apparatus, bladders and turpentine, assistance to mix colors, stretch canvases, and so on in the 18th century. So on this quite practical level, pastels in the 18th century offered a potentially more accessible point of entry into art making than oils. And so several of the most distinguished pastel practitioners of the age, most notably the great Venetian artist Rosalba Carriera, an example of whose work from the MFA collection we see here, were themselves women. Manet's new reputation as the painter of elegant women, therefore, was surely tied to his exploration of a medium already long identified with female artists. Now, the traditional support for pastel was rough blue paper of the kind used here by Carriera, made from coarse pulped workman's rags, so workman's clothing, you know, like blue jeans basically turned into rags, um, pulped and, and then made into paper. Blue paper both established a cool middle tone for the composition, and because of its rugged surface texture, helped retain the colored dust that is pastel. Um, though clearly familiar with the blue paper tradition, Manet used a very different support for his pastels. In this detail of the portrait of Valtès, we can make out the fine weave of a canvas prepared with a pale gray, oil-based ground. Mana used the weave of the canvas as a design element to break up his lines of chalk, creating the bold graphic touches we find, for example, in this sitter's lace collar and curls. But his use of this rather experimental support has also sometimes resulted in long-term condition problems, what we call adhesion failure, when flakes of pigment curl up off the surface like potato chips, and sometimes, as in this sitter's hair, fall off the surface entirely. So where did Manet get the idea to use this peculiar canvas support? The answer, almost certainly, is his pupil, Eva Gonzalez, who, as you'll remember, had arrived in his studio in 1870 with much more formal training in pastels than Manet would ever receive. Here we see a work by Gonzalez, today in a private collection, whose fine weave canvas, prepared with a pale gray ground, is strikingly similar to those we see in Manet's Vie Moderne pastels. Moreover, the bust-length format, vig format and vigorous 
graphic handling, also seemed to anticipate those of her teacher. Gonzalez had exhibited pastels at the Salon throughout the 1870s, and it seems very likely that the excess, success she achieved in this quintessentially feminine medium encouraged Manet to try his hand at it. His growing physical limitations um, would have made the less physically taxing medium of pastel all the more appealing in the years ahead. So both this work and Manet's portrait of Valtesse were shown at the Salon in 1880. Seeing them side by side, I think one can't help but be struck by their extraordinary technical similarity. Gonzalez's work, however, received the better reviews and has survived much more intact, indicating perhaps her superior technical command over the medium and support. Manet's feverish activity between the Vimeron show and the Salon in the spring of 1880 didn't do his health any favors. And on the advice of his doctors, he retreated that June to the suburban spa town of Bellevue, southwest of Paris, so really just on the other side of the Bois de Boulogne, which I think is important to bear in mind for what follows. So he remained there undergoing a course of hydrotherapy until November. It was the first of three summers he would spend pursuing rest and bathing cures outside the capital. Though accompanied by his wife and mother, Manet quickly grew lonely and bored with life in the country, as he called it, and began to fill the margins of his letters to friends and colleagues back in Paris or on vacation in Normandy with watercolor illustrations. The largest surviving cache of these was addressed to Isabelle Le Meunier, the Vie Moderne publisher's sister-in-law, whom you'll remember from her pastel portrait. Here's a letter that Manet sent to her from Bellevue, where her likeness serves as letterhead. He also sent her watercolor roses and morning glories, cats and peaches, a pile of crumpled paper lanterns after a party, and so on. Nor was she the only lucky correspondent who opened the mail that summer to find a miniature Manet. This letter to the printmaker Félix Braquemont contains a particularly splendid watering can nestled in the grass beside a sleeping cat. And this sheet, acquired just this year by the Getty, shows a snail perched on a fallen leaf above a plea to his unnamed correspondent for more English paper, probably the thin fool's cap on which he wrote this letter and so many others, which all have English watermarks. So one curious thing about all of the Bellevue watercolors in the context of Manet's broader production is that they contain no graphite or pen underdrawing. Forms seem conjured from the flat page with watercolor and brush alone. The reason this seems slightly odd to a Manet specialist is that the watercolors he had made early in his career look something like this, an image of the dead Christ based on an 1864 salon painting today in the Musée d'Orsay. As you can see, the design is clearly laid in with graphite and pen and then essentially colored in like a page in a coloring book using the brush. So a zoomed in detail of one of the angels, I think, allows us to see this still more clearly. Um, there's pen over graphite that's then filled in with washes of transparent color. And then, all at once, in the summer of 1880, the underdrawing disappears. And even the most complicated shapes seem to be constructed with the brush alone. Here, of course, we see a detail of the snail from the Getty drawing. The apparent insouciance of these illustrations, their playfulness, their nonchalance, were plainly calculated to impress. And for over a century, art historians bought it. Um, so th they've repeated a familiar story about these works, that they're casual and dashed off in the margins, breezy and effortlessly virtuosic, um, displaying a singular unity of observation and execution. But the truth seems to be more complicated. So this drawing is generally treated in the literature as an independent work. Though sketchy in appearance, it follows the established procedure of Manet's earlier watercolors. The forms are described first with graphite and then colored in with the brush. The sheet of paper, which exhibits actually a faint graph paper pattern um, and also has rounded corners on one edge and binding holes along the other edge. So these are signs that this is a sheet that was actually torn out of one of his pocket sketchbooks and the sort of scribbly style of the graphite here matches 
what we find everywhere in, in Manet's pocket sketchbooks. But what he did next with this drawing is what's more surprising. So having fleshed out the graphite composition with watercolor, he seems to have laid a sheet of semi-transparent stationery over the sketchbook page and traced the design into the margin of a letter. So here we see that letter. There it joined a whole cast of well-turned ankles and ruffled hemlines scattered through the text. This letter was addressed to Madame Guillemet, a fashion hound like Manet, whom you'll remember as the model for the conservatory painting. So here we see the two versions of the design to scale, with the original sketchbook drawing, of course, on the left, and the detail of the tracing and the letter on the right. These two pairs of ankles, I think you, you can see, these two cafe tables and hemlines are not approximately, but exactly the same size, arranged in not approximately, but exactly the same configuration. By tracing the design, Manet effectively subtracted the graphite underdrawing from the illustration in the letter, a kind of magic trick that produces a seemingly effortless image that betrays no sign of the process by which it was made. Once we know to compare the sketchbook drawings with the watercolored letters, we find evidence of tracing everywhere. In another letter to Madame Guillemet, decorated with her unmistakable likeness and today in private hands, in a letter to Isabelle Le Meunier, decorated with Madame Manet's cat, Zizi, um, which actually shares this motif with another letter sent that summer to the printmaker Henri-Charles Girard, who was on holiday at the beach in Honfleur. So here's Zizi, of course, in that letter, whose dimensions exactly match those of, of Zizi in the other letter and Zizi in the sketchbook. Um, Girard had actually just married Eva Gonzalez, and so Manet had every reason here to show off. So here we see the other side of the, of the same letter um, with the envelope in which it was sent, which survives, which is sort of fun. Both of these objects now belong to the Fondation Custodia in Paris. Dated with a peach, the letter contains shrimps and chips for the Normandy coast, a swallow and a group of human portraits along with the feline one. The profile portrait of the artist's wife, Suzanne Manet, that appears here, um, also has a surviving precedent in a sketchbook drawing today at the Metropolitan Museum, which Manet also seems to have used twice. He was, you know, very economical. Uh, first in a letter to an unidentified female correspondent, today in a private collection, and again in the Gerard letter. Um, so the same design, obviously, three times. Figuring out Manet's use of tracing in these letters and in the other watercolors he made at Belle has been one of the most exciting discoveries we've made in preparing the show, which will include the largest gathering of these related objects ever exhibited together. Of course, the watercolors didn't take up all of Manet's time at Belle His major painting project that summer was this portrait of the opera star Émilie Ambre in the title role of Georges Bizet's recent smash hit, Carmen. Ambre was Manet's neighbor at Bellevue, and he spent many afternoons painting at her mini chateau there. When the weather was better, he also painted in the garden of his own rented villa, turning out bright, sketch-like scenes of friends and visitors. Here we actually see the younger sister of Madame Guillemet, who stayed with the Manets over the Bastille Day holiday to pose for the painter in her favorite garden hat. In that same garden, Manet painted this tall Trumo format canvas, today in a private collection, with a watering can and rake posed before a stand of slender trees. Once back in Paris, he seems to have hung this canvas on his studio wall, where it furnished a fictive outdoor setting for several pictures he would paint over the course of the following year. Here, for example, in a painting from the Art Institute of Chicago's collection, an elegant reader peruses her newspaper before a sunny green backdrop. Her glass of beer and the wooden bar attached to her newspaper identify the intended setting as a cafe or brasserie where beer was served and reading matter was supplied on magazine racks. Breathless brushwork encourages us to believe that the artist has recorded this scene from life at an outdoor cafe. But in fact, we recognize the sun-dappled path, the stand of slender trees, and even the watering can from this picture, and there are actually, when you look very closely, hints that, that the picture hung framed in his studio. This may be what remains of a, of a gilt picture frame. Um, 
The same landscape also served as a backdrop for this portrait of a family friend dressed for a stroll today in Tokyo. As the somewhat unresolved appearance of the lower left-hand portion here suggests, it's a little bit on the right too, um, Manny seems to have abandoned this picture unfinished. And indeed, the canvas was one of more than 100 left in his studio at the time of his death in the spring of 1883. Here we come to a peculiar obstacle in understanding Manet's late work. So much of it is left unfinished. If we can learn to reject the gendered criticisms of slightness and frivolity once leveled against late Manet, we have to take more seriously the very real problem posed by his unfinished work and what became of it after his death. That painting in oils had grown increasingly exhausting for Manet in these years is obvious from the very large number of pictures left incomplete in his studio. Some of them, like this lively portrait in Chicago, shed light on his procedures, the use of a thin green wash, for example, to lay in what would surely have become a leafy background. Or the pattern of close attention to the face petering out near the bottom of the composition, quite similar to what we observe in the pastels, but seen here in an oil portrait of the artist's wife, now in the Norton Simon Museum. The unfinished works are sometimes all that remain of unrealized ambitions. In this case, a planned picture of a dashing female rider that Manet had hoped to exhibit at the Salon of 1883. Or in this case, a plein air nude in a summer hat. Many of these unfinished pictures, however, are probably things Manet wouldn't have wanted us to see at all. Beginnings of sketches he would have scraped down, painted over, had he lived, or even burnt, had he realized he was going to die. We know that he made a drastic edit of his oeuvre in the mid-1860s, cutting things up and throwing them away, but he never had a chance to do the same for the production of the late 1870s and early 1880s. In fact, he counted on a friend, the critic Théodore Duret, to do this for him <coughs> after his death. Duret was assigned the task of deciding which studio scraps to keep and which to destroy, but he seems to have destroyed nothing, preferring instead <coughs> to stamp things left in the studio with a red EM, seen here at lower right, along with the um, catalog for the, the giant sale um, in which all the studio contents were liquidated in February of 1884 in order to benefit the painter's widow who had been left in financial difficulties. Prior to the public sale, a number of incomplete pictures were sent out to be finished by other artists and in the subsequent decades, many more unfinished works were doctored by unscrupulous dealers in order to enhance their saleability. In some cases, likely, lightly indicated sketches were transformed into complete paintings to strange and disturbing effect. Because the majority of Manet's unfinished canvases date from his late career, the phenomenon of posthumous retouching has sometimes distorted our sense of his late style. One picture that we do know was finished um, which is really just to say, in this case, quite heavily retouched, is this portrayal of a majestic copper-haired lady in sable and sapphires posed against a flowery backdrop, which Manet's early biographers tell us was actually a Japanese kimono hung on the wall just behind her. If we look closely at this um, area of the background just in front of her face, um, you can see that someone has gone back in with a color of blue that no longer quite matches Manet's original and painted out some of the flowered textile, probably to help separate profile from pattern, figure from ground. Something of the delicate interplay between the two was lost in the process, though Manet's work on the painting was, thankfully, far enough advanced to make the subsequent intervention less disfiguring than it could have been, or than it was in so many other cases. Now in the Musée des Beaux-Arts at Nancy, this painting was originally intended as a pendant to the Getty picture, whose success at the Salon of 1882, as we have seen, inspired Manet to embark on a suite of the seasons, each represented by a Parisienne of a different age and type. Wrapped in fur, her hands thrust into a muff, the mature Venetian blonde of the Nancy painting was autumn to the young brunette of spring. The model for Autumn, however, was not just any comely strawberry blonde of a certain age. She was Mary Laurent, a retired actress of formidable intellect and vivacious temperament. Kept in grand style by a wealthy American dentist, Laurent was cultivated and generous, 
well-connected in artistic and literary circles, a muse for various painters and poets, the primary model for the courtesan character of Odette in Marcel Proust à la recherche du temps perdu. Her many admirers included Stéphane Mallarmé, who, as you'll remember, had been an almost daily visitor to Manet's studio in the mid-1870s. It was Mallarmé, in fact, who brought Mary Laurent there in the spring of 1876 to see Manet's rejected salon submissions, which he had, had put on view um, in sort of defiance of the jury once again. So here at upper left, you see Mallarmé's invitation to that open studio, and then, and then here at right, one of the rejected pictures, now at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. Um, Laurent loved and immediately understood this painting, um, an open-air scene of a laundress and her child at work. Her keen appreciation for it charmed and impressed Manet, who quickly befriended her and likely had her pose for a series of pastel toilette scenes made in the late 1870s and no doubt inspired by the contemporary pastel nudes of Edgar Degas. But Laurent was much more than a model. She was also a confidant, a patron, and perhaps something further. She was the only woman other than his wife whom Manet addressed in letters using the informal tu. He shared with her the painful and humiliating details of his medical treatments and his periodic depressions. And she shared with him her social network, especially her glamorous actress friends and their wealthy lovers. Here we see a particularly beautiful letter that Manet sent to her from Bellevue, decorated with a stalk of morning glory, a symbol of faithful friendship. It was Mary Laurent, the, early, the artist's early biographers tell us, who encouraged Manet to, take, uh, to, to make his pastel portraits, bringing him clients and posing for several herself. Here see, we see one of her with her pet pug um, that's today at the Pushkin Museum. Here another from the Clark Art Institute where she sports a natty toque hat with a dotted veil and a sumptuous fur stole. Um, and... Uh, here a really late great example, I think, from the last year of his life, a symphony of ostrich feathers and black silk taffeta today at the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Dijon. It was Mary Laurent, too, who encouraged Manet to paint flowers, bringing roses and especially lilacs to his studio, his sickbed, and eventually his grave. Here we see one such bouquet that actually belonged to Laurent's protector, the American dentist, Thomas Evans, who no doubt bought it at Laurent's urging and who later donated it to the dental school of the University of Pennsylvania where it languished, forgotten, for the better part of a century. Um, it was rediscovered in 1979 and um, now hangs in the Musée d'Orsay. The late flower still lifes are, quite simply, some of the most beautiful pictures Manet ever painted. In their compositional concision, their dazzling variety and ingenuity of paint application, they conjure endless possibilities from their finite, perishable ingredients. Here a cloud of white lilac seems to hover over an etched glass vase, which reappears in many of these compositions. Um, the airy contours of the blossoms left in reserve spring to life with dainty touches of impasto. In some of these paintings, the flower's uh, stem seem to twist and turn in the transparent depths of the vase, a dark counterpoint to the explos explosion of bright blossoms above. The, so that last example was from the Nelson Atkins, and this one is from, from Dallas, and they will both be in the show. Um, some compositions deploy fancy glassware, like this gilt chinoiserie vase, paired with a firework of peony petals and drooping leathery leaves in a composition today in private hands. Others seem to use whatever vessel was available. Here a champagne flute plays the part of a bud vase, supporting red and yellow roses. And here a drinking water carafe hosts a tight fistful of buds with stripped leaves floating in the water below and one stalk that couldn't quite fit resting on the tabletop. These compositions, by no means large, have about the same dimensions as the pastel portraits, roughly you know, 20, 22 inches by you know, 15, 16 inches. But some are considerably smaller, actually not much larger than the largest of the Bellevue letters. Works like this one always remind me of Manet's famous remark, 
Concision in art is a necessity and an elegance. And I do promise that we're almost at the end. <laughs> Speaking of concision. Um, though thanks in part to Laurent and her friends, these still lives found a ready market among society collectors in Paris in the early 1880s. Manet also gave some of them away as gallant presents, especially to female admirers. He presented this bright nosegay today in Washington as a New Year's gift to a young lady in 1883, having given away this little bouquet just a few months before. Lately sold with the Rockefeller collection in New York, these lilacs and roses were originally intended for the daughter of one of Manet's doctors, Ginevra Euro de Villeneuve, who wrote in her thank you note to the painter, I love flowers, white lilacs and roses above all. You've given me the liveliest pleasure by sending me some that will never die. Flowers that will never fade, beautiful girls who will never grow old, gardens where the sun will always shine. These are the legacy of Manet's last years. Lending permanence to the impermanent, lasting form to the most fleeting of life's pleasures, the late work gestures toward a never quite realized vision for the future of modern painting, based on beauty, fashion, and happiness. Thank you. Uh, Emily has said she'll take some questions from the audience, so hopefully they're short and concise, no speeches or <laughs> on Manet, so, so feel free to ask. There are microphones on either side of the room. We have one question here. Thank you for that beautiful lecture. Uh, my question is this. The, uh, you showed several unfinished pictures, one of which seemed to have been signed. So did he sign unfinished pictures? So I think you're probably referring to the Norton Simon painting. And that picture is signed by Madame Manet, who signed some works um, in later years as, as she sold them um, piecemeal. So that's one that wasn't in the studio sale that she sold later. Um, and so her signature functionally authenticates that work. Of course. I'm wondering what you think of I'm wondering what you think of his early still lifes, like mm. the basket of fruit, which is also in the MFA, <laughs> which I love too. Um, that one seems to be of a piece with some of his later work because it's very sketchy in the way mm -hmm. that his flowers are. So I'm yeah. wondering what you think of that. Well, I love that painting too. Um, and it's somewhat unusually, it's a somewhat unusually small picture um, for, for that early point in his career. Um, he, you know, paints a, a group of still lives, a lot of them sort of either indebted to, to 17th century Dutch models, or I would argue that one is very indebted to, to the 18th century French painter Chardin. Um, and, and I think we see less of that kind of explicit referencing happening in the late work, even though certainly he does, he, he does paint fruit and flowers at the end too. So I think there's that difference. I would definitely agree with you that the, the MFA picture, the, the little still life of fruit, is sketchily painted, but it's sketchy in the way that the work of the 1860s is sketchy. It's sort of creamy and broad, whereas the late um, still lives um, are often painted with a finer tipped brush. They're more about sort of the play of reflection, say, on the surface of a mandarin orange or something like that, um, and less about those sort of creamy strokes that you see in the Boston picture, if that makes sense. Really? No other questions? Okay, a couple down here. <laughs> so, logistics question. With much of his great late works for pastels, and we know them to be, we know pastels to be very uh, fragile or perceived as such. Uh, what kind of challenge is it to you to do a two venue exhibition with pastels? I mean, I think doing a one venue exhibition with pastels is tricky, unless, I mean, you know, you're working with your own magnificent collection of pastels as, as Katie did um, last year. Um, it certainly poses challenges and we sent a lot of letters and, and got a lot of responses that things were too fragile to travel. Um, fortunately, you know, we will present a group of pastels in the show that 
our conservators and the con conservators of our, you know, the, the lending institutions have deemed safe for travel. There's huge variety in all pastels, I would say, in how sort of fast they are, how well affixed to the surface the, you know, powdery medium is. Um, and there's certainly a lot of variation in, in mayonnaise pastels, which are on this sort of, are usually on this weird experimental kind of support. A little later in the 19th century, canvas supports that have a more sort of um, almost cement-like preparation on them, a sort of roughly textured preparation, a bit like sandpaper. Uh, this kind of, this, this specially prepared kind of canvas is invented, but it doesn't really come along soon enough for Manet. So his pastels on canvas are often much more vulnerable than those of like Giuseppe De Nittis. Thank you for a great talk. That was really, really, really wonderful. <laughs> I, I never really thought of Renoir and Manet, but in looking at some of these late paintings and, mm. and your Getty painting, I was wondering, I don't really know, what was his relationship, or did he like Renoir, or was he looking at all at Renoir at the time? That's such a great question. I think, without a doubt, he's looking at Renoir. Um, but I think his his admiration for Renoir is not avowed in the way that his admiration for Monet is. So there's this, you know, sort of famous anecdote during that summer that, that Manet spends with, with Monet at Argenteuil, Renoir comes for a visit and they all, you know, paint in the garden together. Um, Manet uh, paints a, a scene of Monet and his, his wife and, and son in the garden. Renoir paints, you know, at the same moment, uh, Monet's, Monet's wife and son. And afterwards, uh, Manet sort of says to Renoir, or rather says to Monet, you know, you should maybe tell your friend that, you know, it's not going to work out for him, you know. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, but, but it feels, I mean, you know, the, that sort of complicated relationship with Renoir, whom I think he absolutely admired and totally stole things from, for sure, seems to me somewhat emblematic of his relationship, his ambivalent relationship to Impressionism more broadly. That he sort of wants to take credit for it, but then doesn't want to exhibit with them. That he wants to um, steal things from, from their technique, but doesn't always want to admit it. Um, that's maybe a longer answer than you're looking for. But it's a, yeah, it's a fascinating relationship, I think. Great. Thank you very much.